awareness of raw footage that survives in the All over the world yep. capturing footage yep. for this. W what other places did you see that footage? Do you yeah. know what's on there? In fact, you can go. We're going to go to the website in a minute. Some of this footage is now starting to be put online at the University of South Carolina. Uh, it's now called Moving Image Research Collection. And a lot of it's Fox Movie Channel and Sue uh, founder of Fox Silent Movie. Back then it was called Fox Movie. <laughs> Different brand altogether. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was called. Um, another remarkable piece of footage that we don't have time to look at but is there is called uh, NYC Street Scenes and Noises, 1929. Yeah. And it's just raw footage of what New York City sounded oh. like in 1929 downtown Times Square. Oh. It's a really amazing kind of time machine effect where you hear honking horns and horses and carts and trains, all the stuff kind of mixed together with the noise of the city. Is it very noisy? Is that? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's online. It's a, it's, I'll show you the web page in just a second. Um, the, the huge majority of the footage, though, is not available online and is still not yet preserved, um, but it is steadily making its way into preserved space so that we can watch it. Um, it's kind of good and bad news. That's a sample of the from Charleston in terms of working with man. Uh, it's kind of the best case scenario for film preservation because it was shot on 35 millimeter film back in an era when uh, nitrate cellulose film bed was the norm. All, almost every Hollywood film or professional produ production before 1950 was shot on nitrate film if it was shot on 35 millimeter. And it had a look and a luster and a high silver content that made it <laughs> the most beautiful film shot uh, as everyone has seen them. Testify. Almost never today can you see an actual nitrate film tank projected through a projector onto the screen. But if you're interested, the first three days in May, the Georgie Hall and Raj Festival in New York is having a festival where they only show those types of films. Huh. Yeah. Everything from Hollywood prints to experiments, silent movies, news reels, and so on. Um, where else they went? Uh, at the same time the crew was shooting New York Street Food and Noises in 1929, they were crewed shooting the same thing, just raw tape, let's listen and record kitchen sounds uh, in Tokyo, and Jakarta, and Cairo, Jerusalem. And it's really amazing the world's happening that they're shooting. Um, and even occasionally out <coughs> outside of city shoots. Um, and if you're a fan of the book you read, like me, you're like, yeah, the 20s. That's like the best decade <laughs> of all the most interesting things going on. So that's why I love this particular collection so much. Um, so newsreels, which exist by the thousands, uh, are one of those. The short takeaway, though, is that, <coughs> as you probably know, when you went to a movie theater in, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, <coughs> early 60s, you almost always got a 10-minute news package edited newsreel from one of the major companies. Those things that went out to theaters in a package edited form, the vast majority of them no longer exist. They were not cared for when they went back to the studios, but the studios chopped them up and classified them and saved them as stock footage sometimes. A lot of that doesn't survive as well, but what does survive are the outtakes, parts of those stories, and fragments. Uh, but I say survive, again, the majority of it from the silent period from the 20s and has gone forever. There's no copies made because the film stock is very highly perishable. But when something does survive, it's kind of a cause for celebration. Um, so this is just a, a list of some of the significant types of film <coughs> that uh, we can categorize as orphans, or infamously neglected, I think is the way that I like to, to categorize it. <coughs> Discovering this new universe seems to me, uh, in the last 15 years anyway, of these types of films, and counterposing them to what we're all familiar with through Hollywood and commercial feature films, is, is quite interesting, because collectively they offer a much different kind of portrait of what the world was like if you studied the world through those uh, through those genres, particularly when you get into amateur and home movies, which until recently with home movies was kind of dismissed as something insignificant, but now more and more people are appreciating what, a, what valuable documented evidence they are of the world as people lived it, um, particularly, you know, in the American home after World War II, but amateur film dates even uh, back much further than that. Um, <coughs> where does this? Yeah, let's see. So this is going to take us to the web page that I was referring to. Um, at the University of South Carolina. Um, I'll come up here in just a second. So of the thousands of pieces of film that are there, there are now a couple hundred. Not all of it's a uh, newsreel, not all of it's Fox movie film, but this is a silent piece of footage from 1926. So it's just all stainless with cargo air mail service, routine. What they're loading in are pieces of 35 millimeter newsreel footage that they've shot. And they're flying it from St. Louis to Chicago. <coughs> and this is the newsreel man coming up with his son. He drops the box of film and they hand it to the pilot. And the pilot is Charles Lindbergh. Oh. 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 The story was famous. Wow. <laughs> this was discovered uh, about 10 years ago. Tom Donano oh. is now part of the documentary evidence. So oh. that's oh. another big area. Sorry? How old was he there? About 25? Or yeah, so he's yeah. really young. Yeah, so it's, it's just well, exact, almost exactly a year, year and a month before his parents have got his flight. Uh, but he's certainly a pretty anonymous fellow, as, as you gleaned from the book. Um, so 
And that one shot is like the great crayon. It's also a great film, mm -hmm. the film that's the, a, a baby hanging from a piece of film <laughs> to fly safely to Chicago where you know, the movie, yeah. movie film headquarters was based. descriptions and tapes, so it's very kind of fun to watch. They're usually four or five minutes chunks. Um, amateur films and home movies, another thing that I uh, find fascinating. Uh, amateur films uh, are generally dated to begin uh, in their most popular phase in 1923, when Eastman Kodak introduced 16 millimeter film, and it was designed to be for consumer amateurs shoot film of whatever they wanted. Sometimes to make story films, but also just to document daily life in what we now call home movies. Mm -hmm. But there were film technologies from the very beginning which were um, either the professional 35 millimeter shots, which is what looks like. This was found a couple of years ago by a family, Lily, Joy, open the closet, what is this? <laughs> Grandfather's thing. Grandfather kept a diary at Mo uh, living in Colorado at the turn of the century on how he got his camera and he shot film. So there's about uh, 60 second fragments of this home movie playing single TV chicken in 1905. And we think it's the earliest surviving home movie, maybe in the world, but it's certainly in the United, in the United States. Um, and I just found out that four more films were found from by his family, uh, made more or less at the same time. I haven't seen those yet, but they will uh, start to come into the world. So just to think of the, the value of home movies in this way, <coughs> one project that I work on regularly is with uh, a film museum in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, if you follow a film you might have heard a couple years ago, they discovered there the lost director's cut complete print of Metropolis, one of the most <laughs> famous films of the time of the 1927, once again. Uh, that film had been restored many times by the Germans who thought they had done it defensively. They assumed that footage was gone forever in Argentina, and it was 30 minutes from what footage showed up at a, a inspection of old films in 19, uh, 2008 is when it was discovered. This is from that same collection. It's described by this man named Pablo Ducos, who was who the museum is now named for. And he was shooting 1923, uh, the year I named. He was shown his the amateur films to his school, the school sort of the high school that he was at at the time. As you can see, he was uh, dealing professionally with doing some teaching to the films as well. Uh, now, in the early or the mid-teens, the French company Pate, which was the biggest film company in the world in terms of manufacturing, introduced a couple of new technologies. One was 28 millimeter film, which didn't really take too broadly in the United States, although this was an American attempt to package it. So it was uh, so-called safety film. It wasn't nitrate, dangerous, flammable. It was made to be safe to show at home without the risk of fire. Um, slightly smaller than the 35. So it could be used to take home movies, but also lots of educational films and copies of professional movies that you could buy and show at home, you know, Chaplin <coughs> films and so on were available in 28 millimeter. Uh, 9.5 millimeter was the other film stock of the, of the second. 1926 is another important year for the history of amateur film. Uh, this man, Hiram Percy Maxim, uh, famous for inventing the Maxim gun technology. Uh, a wealthy background, his father was wealthy, his children were influential, so it's a very important family and for a lot of reasons. But just as his hobby, one of the things he did besides founding the Amateur Radio League was to found the Amateur Cinema League in 1926 um, and started shooting his own home movies. Uh, and thousands of members became, he got their first 16 millimeter cameras in the 1920s. They had little trailers that they would tug into the beginning of their films to identify themselves as proud members of the league. Uh, and in 1926, they began publishing a, a, a magazine that came out monthly for several decades. Uh, and said, <coughs> this is how they identified their mission. Uh, the pleasure of making home motion pictures, promoting amateur cinematography, organized clubs. Um, here's some uh, <coughs> really beautiful design of their magazine in the earliest years. This, uh, and now the entire run of this journal is now searchable and downloadable um, if you're interested in 
just looking at them, the the quick thing is something called Lantern. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Lantern, it'll lead you to a web page um, that's been recently added where you can search for all kinds of material that relate to film and broadcast history. This is where I got the the digital download from here. combination of our amateur film culture met popular uh, mainstream theatrical film culture. Um, so this is a really great book <laughs> that came out, uh, it's now uh, 2008, the film came out, uh, Fight Pictures. Um, only kind of film archivist nerd recognize, <laughs> get a thrill out of the picture. So the picture was chosen by the book designers because of <laughs> representation of boxing. But this is a very specific uh, type of film. This is that 9.5 millimeter new uh, uh, small gauge amateur home movie technology. Uh, so this film was actually made in the 20s, even though it looks a little more antique than that. <coughs> it was just something you could buy uh, and show at home, right? We had a 9.5 millimeter projector. Um, I don't know, but it's hard to identify. I didn't recognize either gentleman. Even though it's 1924, it's actually Z Tunney on the left. And again, <laughs> he's, not, he's not known as a person at the time. And the guy on the right is James Corbett, who was heavily wow. candidate in the 1890s. So it's a weird kind of film student <laughs> mixture. Uh, this is the kind of uh, projector for showing at home 9.5 millimeter. It was actually marketed under the name Baby Cafe. Uh, but also in the 20s, in this era uh, where we read so much about the um, Da Vinci hunting fights of 1927, uh, but all over the place, even the minor fights like the Zagreb fight here. So this was snapshot of the movie page from the New York Times uh, in the mid 1920s. So uh, something like recordings of boxing matches were coexisting alongside the, the kind of mainstream Hollywood tale, but not conventional what we think of when we think of film history. But the 1925 to 26 and 27 uh, were enormous, and I don't need to repeat that. Since uh, the Viking's book uh, gives us a great perspective on it. But what I found interesting was, in 1927, how would you see a film replay of the event? I mean, Captain Fight in particular, you widely see in slow motion replay because of the controversy of knockouts. Uh, this was an advertisement uh, for buying boxing films and watching them at home. Uh, on the night that the fight took place, uh, the films would be shot in 35 millimeter, then left for film lab. And eventually those went to commercial theaters and big paying audiences saw them. But less than 48 hours after it, you could actually go to a camera shop in Chicago and buy a 16 millimeter home movie copy and show it in your home of the Vinci Tunney fight. And I found this uh, account verifying the kind of vividness of that. This was written by a columnist for the Washington Post who was, I would, I would call her a flapper. She was in her early, to mid 20s, and this was a couple years ago, uh, kind of a movie appreciation and gossip column. Um, she just arrived at the Carnegie in New York, where suddenly the lights went out uh, and the Vinci Tony Park pictures, which everyone had been reading about, suddenly were available to them, and they watched in slow motion. Um, <coughs> and I love the way that she described it uh, in quite vivid detail. Um, they're almost a sensuous, um, a young woman appreciating the male body is what uh, is also described in other texts of what appeared. Um, but then she concludes and tells us at the end, the picture projected by the baby cafe projector, which is even, that's how well known the technology was, that the brand name was entering into popular discourse of mainstream newspapers. And this is how the film, how people encountered the film. And I'm gonna show you now one of my favorite newspaper ads of all time. This is also from 1927. It's from um, it's a vintage New York newspaper. I'm pretty sure it is the Times, but it appeared in multiple New York newspapers. So it's an ad for a neighborhood theater in Brooklyn. It's the French, named after the French movie that you can watch. Uh, so nowadays you would think of it as an art house, right? Because they show European films and all kinds of things. And it's happening in South Chicago at a now a famous landmark in the history of cinema, particularly in um, artistic uses of the medium. But that film came out, eight, was made eight years before this. So it's actually a re-release revival of the film uh, at the end of the time period. And then they're showing with it the Vinci Tony Park picture. <laughs> <laughs> what would it have been like? 
see at the movie theaters <laughs> and see the cabinet of Dr. Caligari is expressed in the of horror film and the <laughs> Titanic <laughs> is a part of the Dead of Winter. Um, I love kind of revisiting what filmmaking was instead of what we think based on conventional accounts it was. Um, so that even just taking a very narrow strip of, of that history um, for boxing films. Great to see you now a, another amateur film, or I should say amateur question mark film. So we have a mystery film, let's call it, <coughs> um, from the Library of Congress. Uh, at the Library of Congress, it doesn't have this title. The person who threw it up on YouTube gave it this title. The person who threw it up on the internet is not actually worked in the film vault <laughs> at the Library of Congress, that's how he got access to it. Um, so I gave, it the, I gave it the title of the text that is here, but it, it actually was donated to the Motion Picture Academy in LA by a photographer slash historian uh, named Earl Titan, who collected early cinema artifacts. Um, the Academy at that time didn't have a film archive in the 19, early 1970s, so they sent it to the Library of Congress, which did have state-of-the-art film archives. And it's just in the library catalog called Unidentified Hyphen Film Number One. And that's all the, the largely known of it. Studying the, the film stock itself, the edge code, it's pretty certain that the film probably dates to 1925, but even that is a guess. I'll let you watch it with the piano music that's been added here.
find it. So if you're interested in seeing more of this uh, uh, Fox movie coming, or Fox Challenger or Fox stuff, this is the, the home page. So you can just go to mirc.sc.edu and get the it's very good show visit stuff. <coughs> Ford had actually a very big 
uh, throughout its whole history as it did uh, film operations, uh, originally producing something we called New Deal, uh, News Weekly, uh, but obviously was sponsored. Uh, but they were not always promotional or for its product, really. Uh, they were trying to serve a kind of uh, civic need in some ways. But it was an interesting uh, film. It's part of a DVD set called Treasures from American Archives. And it's a very important National Film Preservation Foundation.
for the soundtrack. No, the piano score was uh, commissioned for the rest of the you know, the film and the music video. Yeah. 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 Did they have the soundtrack or was it silent? It was uh, originally silent. So anywhere in the piano it was going to be either from the piano or from the piano. Mm -hmm. So more likely someone speaking to the frog and the frog would be history of the MIT uh, that sort of predates Compact. So you heard familiar melodies and compilation scores from the previous two courses. That was uh, very typical practice for um, like in most silent films. You wouldn't have original scores written for them. Are these films in the public domain? It's everything that seems to my ear. And the home movie footage that you were talking about? Is that in the public domain? Uh, that's a really good question. I just have no simple answer to it. <laughs> there are lots and lots of home movies out there on the internet these days. And there are lots and lots of organizations who want to push more of other people's home movies that they find in flea markets than elsewhere. If, if a home movie was made, let's say, in the 1950s, and then it found its way to a yard sale and someone else had it, technically it could be contested that it's in the public domain because it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. given up by its owner. But if someone were actually to prove that they made the film, they could assert that it was what the copyright office would call an unpublished work. And they could say, I am now reclaiming it, and I'm going to publish it today. So a film shot in 1950 could have could have been beginning its copyright term in 2015. Mm. It's a very complicated. In point of fact, I don't know of any case where someone found an old home movie that they didn't know the owner of, where the person actually came forward and made some copyright quest. If, if anything, they're happy to have their family history rediscovered. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, so technically it's not public domain in the legal definition, but it's US, it's what's happened after the term orphan film became popularized in the film preservation community in the 1990s. Now the US Copyright Office actually uses the term as an official category, not just for films, but for all copyrighted <laughs> or, or works. They call it orphan works is the term you might hear a lot, and there's legislation coming in about what to do about this. So it is a problem whether it's a, a book or a song or a film, if you have it, but you're not quite sure if it's public domain or copyrighted, if you're an official institution, you're not likely <coughs> to gamble money by doing something professional with it. And this has curbed the efforts of film archives, of publishers, of musicians. And so we, the, the legislation is trying to find some middle ground that doesn't penalize people who <coughs> say things or uh, in good faith try to find the owner but right now there's no legislation. Uh, and the people in the preservation and library community are starting to think, you know, we shouldn't have legislation because if Congress were to enact some new law, who's gonna dictate the terms of that law? It's gonna be the interest with the Congress lobbyists. So just the way that Disney and the Hollywood studios influenced copyright reform at the end of the 20th century and got copyright extended by an additional 10 years this is likely to happen again. Uh, so some people are very happy that there's this chaos and <laughs> no definition of how to handle uh, an orphan work. Most, uh, the short answer is that films, American films made before 1923 are in the public domain in all cases because the copyright uh, expired. Um, that clock would have ticked forward. We would now have public access to films from 1924 and 25 and 26 and 27 had not copyright redefined all of that in the late 1990s. It was gonna add 20 years to the life. So we're having to wait an extra 20 years to get uh, wide access, non-commercial access to films that otherwise would. The short answer was Mickey Mouse was about yeah, to fall into the public domain. Yeah, where would fall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have one more short film. Yeah. I don't know how to call it up though, so. Oh, okay. Let's see. Let's wrap one here. Here's in the story. Yeah, that's the story. Oh, okay. story. <laughs> it's kind of a, com a light companion piece to what we just saw. Of a, of a newsreel that we now call a Hollywood newsreel. It's Selznick, 
the year next to the company would like to hand you in because it's um, kind of very empirically documentable that starting in the year 1920, uh, a major uh, surgeon's of interest in educational film, you, you will need it in your classroom for direct didactic education purposes instead of thinking of movies as things for movie theaters. Uh, they all the journals in the educational field that dealt with uh, educational film started being published in 1920. A lot of professional literature among people in high school and college education. Universities began film production units uh, in 1920, so there are uh, thousands and thousands of films made only for classroom educational purposes, as well as all the sponsored film material like the Ford Motor uh, production, which also was part of the educational movement. Uh, so it's another important key change, I think, in American culture with the 1920s. Only now being recognized as part of our film history, and, and really a major new research and new discoveries by people uh, who have expertises in things like medicine, uh, oceanography, or what have you, who are now going back and looking at these obscure, lost, and rediscovered films and putting them in really a, a proper context for us to appreciate them, both as pieces of cinema history, but also ways in which movies work and move in the world in a way completely outside 